वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम आर इंदिरा फॉर्मली प्रोफेसर ऑफ सोशोलॉजी एट द यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ माइसोर एंड पेपर कोऑर्डिनेटर फॉर द कोर्स एजुकेशन एंड सोसाइटी माई प्रेजेंटेशन टूडे इज बेस्ड ऑन द मॉड्यूल टाइटल्ड ट्राइब्स एंड एजुकेशनल डिस्कोर्स दिस मॉड्यूल इज रिटन बाई डॉक्टर निशा जॉली नेल्सन असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर ऑफ सोशोलॉजी एट लाइला कॉलेज तिरुवनंतपुरम This module discusses the status of tribal education in India and the schemes and programs that have been introduced from time to time to promote the educational rights of tribals. Tribes constitute 8% of India's population which is the largest in the world. Due to geographical and social isolation, tribal groups have been alienated from most of the benefits of development many of the tribal groups who live in places far removed from where educational institutions imparting modern education are located have for several centuries been deprived of access also tribal communities have depended upon indigenous sources of knowledge for a long time due to forest policies and government legislation they have lost their rights over the forest and their education which was primarily based on their symbiotic relationship with nature today has been losing its ground so many of these groups are caught in a very paradoxical situation having no access either to indigenous modes of knowledge over which they had control and also at the same time not having access to modern education so this module raises very critical questions about the issues that confront tribal education today and tries to seek answers for these questions This module examines the status of tribal education in India by throwing light on the constraints that have hindered effective utilization of opportunities for education by tribal groups and the constitutional provisions and other steps taken by governments from time to time to support tribal groups to overcome the obstacles to their educational development. A few suggestions for improving access, utilization and improvement of quality of education being given to tribals are also given in this module. A note on the concept of tribes. Tribe like caste is a term coined by the colonialist imperialists. and since then it has remained with us the term tribe is primarily a colonial construction it has been used in social science literature to understand the life and culture of a group of people who are predominantly forest dwellers in the first census of india report of 1881 all tribal groups were clubbed under the category of forest tribes this group was actually a part of agricultural and pastoral caste in the 1901 census report by risley they were renamed animists in the 1911 census report by gate they were referred to as tribal animist or the people following tribal religion when hutton wrote the census report of 1921 he classified tribes as hill and forest tribes in the government of india act of 1935 they were named backward tribes and the 1941 census report used the term tribe the nomenclature has undergone many changes in the course of history who are the scheduled tribes article 366 section 25 of the constitution of india refers to scheduled tribes as those tribes or tribal communities who are scheduled in accordance with article 342 of the constitution this article says that only those communities who have been declared as such by the president through an initial public notification or through a subsequent amendment by an act of parliament would be considered scheduled tribes tribes are not part of the traditional hindu caste structure anthropologists have termed tribe as consisting of a single cultural unit having shared traits such as language and the absence of a hierarchical political structure The term scheduled tribe refers to specific indigenous peoples 
whose status is acknowledged to some degree by national legislation. Scheduled tribes in India are more like the indigenous or native people in other parts of the world. The list of scheduled tribes is state or union territory specific and a community declared as a scheduled tribe in one state need not be so in another state. Also within the same state in different districts there may be variation in identification of groups as tribes. The identification of a community as a scheduled tribe is an ongoing process. The essential characteristics first laid down by the Lokur committee for a community to be identified as a scheduled tribe are a. Indications of primitive traits b. Distinctive culture c. Shyness of contact with the community at large d. Geographical isolation and e. Backwardness Distribution of tribes Tribal groups are distributed in different proportions in different parts of the country. The table and a map give a region and year-wise breakup of scheduled tribes in India. History of tribal education in India In the foregoing section, we will be looking at some of the policies, programs and administrative structures adopted by the government for the overall development of education among tribal groups in India. The history of education of tribals in India has passed through different stages. The beginning of formal education for tribes dates back to the pre-independence period. It is basically due to the efforts of Christian missionaries that tribal groups in India started getting exposed to modern education. As early as in the 18th century, the missionaries came to India and began to spread the message of their religion. For that, they established education and health centers in many tribal areas. During the colonial period, the tribal areas were the last to come under British power, primarily due to the difficult and inaccessible terrains they inhabited. The tribal development policy of the British government was isolationist and inclined to follow the policy of laissez faire. This policy helped landlords money lenders and traders to exploit the tribes by way of depriving them of their lands and forest rights, pushing them deep into the interior. No attempt was made either to educate the tribes or to strengthen their economic base as observed by Ghure in 1943. The isolationist policy of the colonial government encouraged missionary activity in tribal areas. Christian missionaries, through their sustained work, introduced various social and educational reform measures in the tribal areas. Consequently, schools and hospitals were set up in some tribal areas. The missionaries in this sense can be considered as pioneers who initiated the process of an organized socio-economic transformation in an otherwise change-resistant tribal life. However, missionary activities were confined to a few pockets and they did not therefore have a significant effect on the overall development of tribes. During the nationalist movement, concerned social workers established a few ashram residential schools for tribal children along with craft-oriented occasional training. Thakar Bapa in 1939 and Godavari Purlekar established ashram schools. The model of these schools was replicated in large numbers in other parts of India after independence. Considering the magnitude of the tribal population and its diversity, the efforts of Christian missionaries and social workers did not make much headway and the tribes remained very backward socio-economically, particularly in their education. After India became independent, fresh initiatives were taken for tribal development by replacing the earlier policy of indifference. The government of India advocated a policy which stressed on the socio-economic upliftment of tribes. With the adoption of the constitution, the promotion of educational opportunities for tribals became the special responsibility of governments both at the centre and state. Article 46 of the Constitution directs the state to promote with special care the education and economic interests of the weaker sections of society and in particular scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. National Policy on Education We may make a special mention of the National Policy on Education of 1986 that laid great emphasis on the education of tribal children and youth and made the following recommendations. 
These include opening primary schools in tribal areas, solving the lacunae in curriculum and infrastructure, encouraging tribal youth to take up teaching in tribal areas, designing incentives keeping the unique needs of tribals in view. The national education policy's objective was to address the heterogeneity and diversity of the tribal population in the country. Status of tribal education. Education in its formalized form was never a part of traditional tribal culture. Therefore, it took a longer period for this group to realize its importance. Many studies reveal that even though government has taken several steps for the educational development of tribal communities, the progress achieved by them is not up to the mark. Literacy rate of scheduled tribes in India from 61 to 2011. The table given here throws light on the literacy rate of tribes in India since 1961. The degree and level of educational development have been quite uneven among different states and among different segments of the population within the same state. Some states with higher tribal concentration in relation to their total population have done exceedingly well in terms of enhancing their literacy rates. The northeastern region of India with states such as Mizoram, Nagaland and Meghalaya falls in this category. But in the states of Madhya Pradesh, Odessa, Rajasthan and Andhra Pradesh which had inhabited by much larger number of tribals as compared to the northeastern states, the rate of tribal literacy continues to be very low. Factors affecting tribal educational attainment Though a number of initiatives have been taken for the development of education among tribal communities, considerable progress has not taken place in their educational attainment due to a vicious cycle of poverty, illiteracy and deprivation. Across generations, this syndrome affects educational prospects of tribal families. In other words, there is a social reproduction of illiteracy and marginalization. Let's now look at some of the important factors responsible for their educational backwardness. Reasons for low educational attainment Tribals continue to lag behind the general population in education. Sujata broadly categorizes the hurdles in the path of tribal education as A. External constraints, B. Internal constraints and C. Socioeconomic and cultural constraints. Let's now try to understand each of these in detail. External constraint. In her extensive study on tribal education, Sujata found that the perspective adopted for educational development of tribal communities has not addressed the specific disadvantages that tribals face. One of the major constraints of tribal education at the planning level is the adoption of a dual system of administration. The Tribal Welfare Department, which deals with tribal life and culture, including education lacks the expertise necessary for educational planning and administration in general and academic supervision and monitoring in particular. On the other hand, the Department of Education, which is the sole authority for planning educational development at state level and formulates guidelines and instructions regarding curriculum, textbooks, teacher requirement, transfer policies, does not work in coordination with the Tribal Welfare Department. It is this lack of coordination between the two departments that often results in persons and institutions working at cross purpose. Internal constraints. The internal problems of tribal education cover such factors as infrastructure, curriculum content, suitable teachers and medium of education. Infrastructure facilities. A majority of schools in tribal areas are without basic infrastructure facilities. Normally school buildings in tribal areas have thatched roofs dilapidated walls and non-plastered floors. A large number of schools in tribal areas function with bare minimum of facilities and often lack proper classrooms, teaching learning materials, blackboards, drinking water facilities, toilet and playground. It is found that in most of the ashram schools which are residential in nature, there is no space for children to sleep. Consequently, the classroom turns into a dormitory in the evenings. Due to lack of minimum sanitary facilities, many children studying in ashram schools are afflicted with contagious diseases such as scabies and diarrhea, leading to high dropout rates. Schools in tribal areas just function with bare minimum facilities. Curriculum content. Though the demand for modifying the curriculum content to suit the tribal context has been an old one, 
No serious effort has been made in this direction in any state except for some sporadic pilot projects. The uniform structure and transaction of curriculum has put tribal children at a disadvantage. In respect of pedagogy, it is found that the rigid systems of formal schooling which emphasize discipline, routine norms, teacher-centered instruction have made the children wary of school. This goes against the culture of free interaction and absence of force as embedded in the tribal ethos and culture prevalent at home. This has led to a sharp division between home and school, leading to lack of interest among the children towards school. This is a major reason for both non-enrollment and dropout. Shortage of suitable teachers. The competency and interest of teachers is of prime importance in generating and sustaining the interest of the students in the classroom. In many cases, non-tribal teachers consider themselves civilized and tribals as uncivilized and savage. So there is little appreciation of the tribal values and way of life. The relationship between children and teachers is not cordial and there are instances of teachers using children for their personal work. The cultural gap results in tribal culture developing a sense of alienation from the teachers. The elite-like behavior of many teachers discourages many parents from sending their children to school or building a rapport with them. It cannot be inferred that the presence of tribal teachers would act as a panacea for all the ills of tribal education. There have been instances of teachers of one tribal group treating students and parents of another tribal community with little or no respect. Medium of education. Language symbolizes social, psychological and emotional expressions of a person. The constitution of India allows the use of a tribal dialect, mother tongue, as the medium of instruction in case the population of that particular tribe is more than one lakh. But this has not been adopted on the grounds of feasibility and viability. Given the fact that most teachers who work in these schools are non-tribal, this arrangement does not generally work. In recent years, some efforts have been made for preparing primers in tribal dialects, but again they have been nullified in the context of inter-tribal rivalry, hierarchy, etc. Also, being small in number, these efforts have not been successful in influencing mainstream education policies. It's also true that there is great diversity in tribal languages and hence even the textbooks prepared in these dialects may not solve the language related problems of different subgroups. It is found that tribal students are often ridiculed, humiliated and reprimanded for speaking in their own language and are punished for failing to converse in the language of the region and lapsing back to their own dialect. Because of their inability to decipher the teaching learning process that takes place either in the regional or national language, a large number of tribal students experience a sense of alienation. In the ultimate analysis, children must be educated in the language of the state or the national language, but they should first be familiar with their own language to develop enthusiasm in classroom deliberations. It is only the linguistic and social skills that they cultivate in their earlier years that can prepare them for formal education in the future. Socio-economic and cultural constraints. In a broad sense, socio-economic and cultural factors that determine educational access as well as performance vis-a-vis -vis tribal children can be identified as follows. A. Poor economic conditions. B. Indifferent attitudes of tribal parents. C. Superstitions and prejudice. Poor economic conditions. Most studies on educational deprivation of tribals have inevitably linked it to their poor economic condition. The main base of tribal livelihood is agriculture, practiced either through shifting or terrace cultivation method, where productivity remains very low. Consequently, children play an important role, contributing directly or indirectly to family income by participating in the family occupation and household work, such as cattle grazing, fuel and fodder collection, etc. They think that if the children are taken away from their normal economic work to attend school, the family is deprived of even the little income which it would have got. In recent years, the efforts of the government have been directed towards improving economic conditions of tribes by introducing various developmental programs and schemes mostly related to agriculture, horticulture and cattle rearing 
backed by subsidies and monetary and non-monetary inputs. A critical analysis of development programs and their effect on tribal households shows that till tribal households reach a threshold level of income and land size, the economic development programs can come into conflict with other activities like education. In a way, it can be said that these development programs seem to be adversely affecting the education of tribal children. Indifferent attitude of tribal parents both the tribal and non-tribal teachers find it very difficult to convince tribal parents to send their children to school. A large section of tribal parents do not send their children to school to utilize the free educational opportunities offered to them. Superstitions and prejudices Except in the case of tribal communities in northeastern region, there is a widespread feeling in the tribal communities that modern education makes their children defiant and insolent and alienates them from the rest of their society. There is an inherent fear that exposure to modern education would also tempt them to seek jobs in cities and towns which in turn might lead to their separation from their families and native communities. The modern education system had made a very few attempts to address cultural specificities in designing education policies for tribal students. This has resulted in the development of a negative self-image. Although it is claimed that tribal students get free education, there are both invisible and visible costs which the state schemes fail to cover. This is especially true of higher levels of education. Cultural constraints. Studies on tribal education in India also point out that while most schools in the tribal belt offer education free of cost, the major cause of high dropout rates of tribal children lies in cultural alienation. Tribal culture hardly finds a representation in content and pedagogical practice. Even if a tribal child, despite his or her poor economic condition, manages to attend school, he or she cannot bridge the huge cultural gulf that exists between the home environment and environment at school. Schemes for educational development of tribal children Since the country became independent and realized the need and importance of carving out special initiatives for ensuring that tribal children were not excluded from utilizing educational opportunities, a number of special schemes have been launched towards achieving this end. Some of the major educational schemes initiated by the Ministry of Tribal Affairs Government of India are hostels for ST girls and boys, establishment of ashram schools in tribal and sapline areas, upgradation of merit for ST students, post-metric scholarship for ST students, national overseas scholarships for ST students, top class education for ST students, Rajiv Gandhi National Fellowship for ST students. Mere provision of textbooks, free education and other accessories do not improve the situation of the education of tribals in India. Efforts have to be made to take into consideration their real life situations, needs and their own knowledge base while devising an educational program. It has often happened that their indigenous knowledge bases have not only been severely threatened but their own expertise has been questioned. So merely forcing them to learn subjects that have no relevance to their lives is also an issue that needs to be seriously addressed. So a really effective tribal educational development program must integrate both indigenous sources of knowledge as well as subjects you know that are currently relevant to their life